Do you know the one leadership skill that has the most potential to improve all other leadership skills? What would you say it is? Would you say it's communication? What about vision? Well, it's actually the skill of emotional intelligence. It's the ability to know how you make other people feel. And that's the area we're all gonna grow in today on the Grow Leader Podcast. As always, before we get started, we wanna say a huge thank you to the generous partners who help make the Grow Leader Podcast happen. And the first is, the Wesleyan Investment Foundation. For over 80 years, WIF has been helping churches and church planners with their borrowing and their investing needs. And maybe you're looking for a place to invest or you're looking for a way to borrow to fund a new project. We really think WIF can help you and you can learn more about them at wifonline.com. We also wanna say a huge thank you to Great American Family. Great American Family is America's premier TV destination for high quality family programming, including, and this matters for this time of the year, Great American Christmas. 24 seven Christmas movies through the end of the year, including 18 original movie premieres. Great American Family is part of the Great American Media portfolio of brands and is carried through all major cable providers. And you can find out more about Great American Family at greatamericanfamily.com. Dot com. And finally, we want to say a big thank you to Compassion International. Compassion International has been working to serve the world's most vulnerable children in the name of Jesus for over 70 years. They have helped over 2.2 million kids and they reach and serve every single child and family through the power of the local church. To learn more about Compassion International and how your church can be a part of helping them accomplish the Great Commission. Visit them at Compassion.com. Well, welcome everyone to the Grow Leader Podcast, where we grow leaders that grow churches by helping them reach their full potential. My name is Matt Miner. I'm your host today. And with me, as always, is Pastor Chris Hodges, PC. How you doing? I'm doing great. This is one of my favorite times of the year. Uh, just coming off the heels of Thanksgiving, probably ate way too much. And But I love December. I love all things related to December, from our legacy offering to our impact conference that we're doing with John Maxwell yeah. this week to our Christmas services. We're doing over 100 Christmas services crazy. across all of our campuses. And man, loads of people are going to come visit our church for the first time and experience Jesus for the first time. So I'm just... Having the, I'm living the dream, Matt Miner. Well, look, I don't know any <laughs> any non busy people this time of year. I think all of us right. uh, have so much going on with family, and also if you're in ministry or wherever you're leading, there's, there's a lot of parties. There's a lot of things going on. Uh, we're also excited about January, about the season we're going to go into. I'm very excited about January because not only are we going to continue something we've done every year, which is the 21 days of prayer and fasting. If you want to join us, by the way, this year it is going to be January 8th through the 28th. Uh, but this year, I'm releasing a brand new book coming out on the first day of the fast called Pray First. And I'm excited about it, not just because I've written a book. I'm really excited about it because I really believe that prayer works. There's never been a revival or an awakening that has ever happened that didn't begin with united prayer. And I really believe that everything is ripe right now for revival in America, revival in our world, and it will begin by united prayer. And that's not just our church, but that's every church, every believer. But I've also made the case that the number one reason why people don't pray isn't for lack of inspiration. Right. I think it's lack of information. I don't think people know what to say after they get past their first few prayer requests or their first few memorized lines that they grew up with, you know, in prayer. And they're, so they're kind of three or four minutes into it. And it's like, okay, now what do I say? When really, you know, Jesus even challenged his disciples, could you not tarry with me? Could you not pray with me for an hour? To which most of them would say, no, right. I can't. It's not because I don't love you. It's because I really don't know what I should say. And really the meat of this book uh, is not only how to make prayer effective in your personal life and in your church life, and how to even raise up personal intercessors and build prayer teams and how to do prayer and fasting. The meat of the book are these six models of prayer that I personally use every time I pray that I've been teaching since I was a youth pastor. Almost 40 years I've been teaching these models of prayer that, I mean, the proof is in the pudding. Right. People use it and it works. And now we have raised up a lot of people who join us in prayer. So all that to say, if you're a pastor or leader that's listening and you would like to have these books available for your church 
at the beginning of the 21 days. You kind of need to order them now, and you can just go to our, our website. Grow Leader has it. We also, the, the book also has a, a prayfirstbook.com website you can go to to find out all the information. But I'm also providing for pastors and leaders two other resources. And one is, if you'd like to do a series on prayer at the beginning of January, actually on January 8th, uh, since January 1st is the first Sunday, we won't begin then, but on January 8th, I've written four messages that I'm giving the outlines away to pastors Great. if they want to preach any or part of it and can change every bit of it. And by the way, I don't need any credit or any mention. Just preach it like you created it yourself, seriously. Um, but I'm also recording one of those four that if you'd like for me to preach in your church via video, you can play this one along with the series or use it however you'd like. And again, we're just giving that away to pastors to serve them. And we'll have all of that in the show notes. If you're brand new to the show, uh, we release a show on the first Monday of every month, but we've actually been in a string here lately where we've had a lot of bonus content coming out and I'm getting a lot of great feedback on the bonus episodes. I think that's gonna be our pattern. I, you hate to promise something that you can't deliver on, you know, but I, what, I, what I would like is that the first Monday of every month be a leadership teaching and we've got, got a great one today. Right. Um, but then somewhere in the middle of the month, release an interview with a friend, somebody that I know that I would like for you to know and just kind of more conversational style, get into their head, get into their minds, find out what makes them tick and learn learn from them. Gotten great feedback. I'm Pastor Jim LaFoon, also pa Pastor Chad Veach. I'm excited about our bonus content we have coming out. Uh, Want to say this, we, we love your feedback as well. And so you can get to us through a direct message on Instagram. You can also, you can email us at podcast at growleader.com. And this is brand new. We're going to try something out. If you have a question for Pastor Chris, for us here on the podcast, send us an audio message just of your question to podcast.growleader.com, your name, where you're from, what you do, and we'll try to use it on the show. We'll answer some questions. Here and I love Q&A. Sometimes yeah. I go into the Highlands College Chapel service, and I just don't preach at all. I'll get on the floor and just do Q&A for an hour, and I love, love, love Q&A. So let's do it podcast at growleader.com. Excited about today's topic. Uh, this is one I feel like we can all grow in more. There's, ne there's never a finish line of growing in this. I think sometimes the phrase, boy, this is the most important thing ever gets overused. <laughs> right. But this may be the most important thing ever. Seriously, Matt. And it comes at a time here in the holiday season where I think it's actually needed. But if you learn this as a leader, what we're going to talk about today, if you learn this as a leader, and if you taught this to your team, and if you lived it out, I promise you everything in your leadership will change yeah. for the good. Because the thesis comes from a book that I read years ago that I've taught, and now I've developed my own outline within the outline of the book on emotional intelligence. Yeah. Daniel Goleman came out with this book called Emotional Intelligence. I think it book came out like in 1995. And his thesis was, you don't just need to work on your competence, on your IQ, you need to work on your relational skills, your EQ, your, your, the emotional quotient. And he came up with five things, five components of emotional intelligence. And so I'm going to give you Daniel Goleman's five, but I'm going to give you my takeaways and my application under each one of those five. And you're one of the best I know at this, by the way, Matt. So I want you to not just moderate the conversation today. I want you to jump in because you're really good at this, of learning how, how, how we come across to people. And first one actually is called self-awareness. And here's the definition. And it's the ability to recognize and understand your moods, <laughs> your emotions, and your drives. And watch this. And how well it affects other people. So in other words, are you aware of how you make people feel? Are you aware how you, how you bring them up, bring them down, intimidate them, encourage them? Do you know your own moods? Do you know, you think you know your personality, but do you really understand your moods, your emotions, your drives? And do you know that when you walk away, how you made people feel? He defines that as self-awareness. And honestly, I've said this for years, if there was one thing that I could just kind of wave the magic wand and give pastors, it would be this, and I've defined it through the lens of self-security or self-confidence, and that comes from having this firm uh, grasp, not only on your abilities, but also your inabilities. Do you know what you're not good at? 
Do you know what you're good at? But do you know what you're not good at? Because the more you understand who you are in Christ and, and even that who you are as a leader, the more you know that, the, the better off you'll be because here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna stop coveting other people's anointing, other people's gifting, other people's city, other people's churches, other people's speaking style, communication style. I remember when I first started uh, Church of the Highlands, I'd already been speaking for quite a while as a youth pastor, but I was now, of course, being influenced uh, by other leaders when I started the new church. And I, I would listen to a lot of leaders like Rick Warren or you know, Joel Osteen or T.D. Jakes and listening to these great communicators. And I have to be honest with you, I tried some of those styles and it was pretty, pretty miserable, my efforts uh, to try to copy some of these styles. And I'll never forget the day, Matt, that I was actually in a pastor's gathering and this pastor was in this setting and I forget even the conversation we were having, but I remember him making this statement and it became a turning point in my personal life. I remember it vividly as a, a, a switch flipped on the inside of me when he said, I'm satisfied with my portion. That's how he said it. Like what the assignment, the gifts, the calling, the space, the people, I don't have everything, but I have my portion and I'm satisfied with it. That's where the self-confidence has to come from. And I'm telling you, Matt, it set me free. I remember saying, I will never covet, covet another person's calling, assignment, buildings, speaking style. It was that day that I embraced Chris. And, and it's not that we're gonna stay where we are and not improve ourselves. No, we still improve. We can still get better and we can still grow. But I wasn't going to try to get outside of a lane or an assignment or a gifting that was never going to be mine. So great. So I was never going to be able to be, you know, preach like T.D. Jakes, and I was never going to be be able to be as nice as Joel Osteen. You know, so I just and smart as most people. I just I'm satisfied with who I am. And when that happened, yeah, this self confidence and this security came on the inside. I I I, I, I not afraid to ask for help know who I am, know who I'm not. And I think it's just an important thing. You know, we've talked about in the past about imposter syndrome. I think that, that this is where we get in trouble, right? When we're trying to be something that we're not, that God did not design us to be, uh, there's, it plays havoc in teams and our communication styles exactly. and everything else. You know, and Jim Collins marks as, as um, the, the, one of the great leaders, what makes a great leader, one of the marks of a great leader is that they're self-deprecating, but you can be self-deprecating whenever you're secure in who you actually right. are. Right. So you don't mind picking on yourself. You can't be self-deprecating if you don't like who you are. Yeah. And so, and this, I think that's one of the things that you can always see in a leader is that, you, you know, you really can't embarrass them. You're not gonna shame them because they're so secure in who they are. So that's the first one, is that just this idea of self-awareness, the ability to recognize, understand your moods, emotions, and drives, as well as their effect on others. The second one is huge. And you already know this one, but I just love the way Daniel Goleman uh, words it, and that's self-regulation. And he defines self-regulation as the ability to now control or redirect your impulses and moods. So we all know that we don't always have good ones. So there are times we all get mad or impatient or frustrated or aggravated at a staff member who didn't do what you were expecting or frustrated with the church. There was this one pastor, he'd get mad about every six months and split the church, you know? Just, he, <laughs> yeah, he'd just, he'd just be so mad at what they weren't doing or what they were doing, and he'd come in and just basically yell a sermon at them and have to rebuild half his church twice a year. Self-regulation says, I recognize that I have those from time to time, and I have the ability, this is huge, to control or redirect those. And so, you know, the Bible says, don't be controlled by that sinful nature, but actually be controlled by the Spirit. That's self-regulation. So it's the ability to kind of be more true to yourself. And, and what'll happen, and I love this, is that when you can control your moods and impulses, it creates now trust in the people that are serving around you. So it's because they're not nervous. They're not, they're not wondering, you know, is PC mad today? Right. Is, he in a, is PC in a good mood today? Wouldn't it be great if we were leading environments where they didn't have to try to figure us out? 
before we walked into the room. And we can all grow in this. And I think that the thing that I, I feel most convicted by when I read this one and even studying about this is, you know, I can fake it with the people on the periphery in the organization, but my kids at home, the people closest to me, the people in direct contact with you all the time. Uh, Pastor Kellen Coldiron, who leads our creative team, we, we had this saying that, you know, if you go running and you get charged by a dog in a yard one time and he just growls and barks at you, now every time you run that route, you're wondering, is that dog gonna come get me? Exactly. And so the goal is don't bark at people. <laughs> If you can go and not bark at people, they don't have to wonder, am I gonna get barked at when I come around this corner? But we're admitting the fact that you still have sure. that mood going right. on on the inside of you. Well, I think what Daniel is saying too, is saying when it happens, control it, right. re regulate it, re redirect it. And so think about this for a minute. What discipline in the Bible, what, what spiritual discipline will help us with that? And I, I maintain it's fasting. Whenever you pick out a season and your whole body is screaming at you for 21 days, give me some food, give me, you know, feed me. I want to watch a TV show or whatever you've set aside for 21 days. And now all of that is screaming at you and you have to tell your body and your moods and your emotions no for 21 days. If you do that regularly, I'm going to tell you, you're going to develop the, the muscle to take an emotion that is not from God that could potentially destroy our organizations, that frustrate people, that cause people not to trust us. And we've learned so much how to say no to it that we actually can feel that and they'll never have to feel it because you're not gonna let it out. Can I ask you a practical question sure. for the leaders out there? Even outside of 21 days of prayer and fasting, which we know as an organization, we, we, we say that, hey, we're gonna do this twice a year. Do you, do you have ways that you're reading yourself and you're going, okay, I know I need to like say no to me for a while and say yes to God, and how does that play out? Well, one of the best things I've ever done, Matt, is I've given certain people permission to, to, to tell me, don't, don't let me be, be crazy here. Don't right. let me be that way. And for a lot of leaders, we don't let the people underneath us s s correct us, speak into our lives that way. And so I've actually picked out people and I said, listen to me. I know I might have a tendency to do this, or to be this way or to be frustrated. Will you tell me when I'm doing it, when I don't notice it? And I'm asking you to, you know, to let me know. So I think that's definitely one way. Another way is, is how we start our day. I think when I start my day with God in worship and really laying all of my life at the foot of the cross, Paul said it this way, I am crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Well, if you don't go through a death process every day. Here's what I know is that something happens in the middle of the night when we sleep is all those zombies and all those bad parts of us, re they reawaken. <laughs> and, and I don't know why it works this way, but it seems like that time I spent with God was really only good for that day. Right. And that's why I think a daily time with God. Okay, here it is again, God. Okay, here it is again, God. Okay, now here it is again, God. All right, here's the next day. I'm doing it all over again, God. And I'm laying it down. I'm, I'm recognizing my emotions, my, my, my impulses, my moods, my sins, and I, and I lay them down. So one of the disciplines that I do every single day is I forgive people in advance for that day. I literally say that, Lord, today, I, I, don't, I not only forgive the people who have hurt me, Lord, I'm gonna forgive anybody who will hurt me today. That's awesome. And before it even happens, I've already released them to you. So I think some of those things help us uh, in that self-regulation. That's so great. What a great reminder just to remember that, man, some of the, the, the basics of Christianity are key leadership principles and <laughs> how we're leading people every day. Exactly. And so I really want us to embrace this, this, this self-awareness, self-regulation. And the third one is, and this one's interesting to me that he has it on the list, but it's understanding your motivation. What, what motivates you? And honestly, are you motivated? And he defines it this way, it's a passion to work for reasons that go beyond money or status. So in other words, you're not doing it for fame and you're not doing it for fortune. You're doing it for this, this other reason. And I think when you speak to Christian leaders, this is something that we understand. You would understand why you would need this in the secular work world and probably the, to the audience that he was writing to. But we know that we, we do what we do, not so that we can have a lot of Instagram followers or have you know, big houses or cars or to be famous or to make a lot of money. We do this for a motivation because we love God and we're serving God. But every great emotional quotient 
leader, everyone who has emotional intelligence has a pure, let me say it that way, a pure motivation for why they do what they do. They have this strong desire to achieve. They, they, they're always focused on something that actually matters. So therefore, they love to learn. They love to grow. They are, they are inherently motivated. Um, I, I call it, you know, curiosity. There's, there's, this, there's this curiosity to know things. And then they always are keeping that motive pure. And you're looking for another way to do that. One of the disciplines that I try to do, Matt, is I try to make sure I'm always in environments that go back to the core of why I do what I do. So it's very easy when you're in the ministry and you, you, know, when you started this ministry, I love souls, I love people, I want people to see people saved. But then we find ourselves only delivering that message on stages right. and then we work in church offices always around Christians, you could easily lose the fire for lost people, for people that are far from God. So there are two things that I try to do to keep my motivation pure. And I want to pass this on as a challenge to our, our podcast listeners today. And that is I always go on a missions trip and hopefully to an underdeveloped world a place where you can see a family in poverty. You can see someone really struggling because when you do, you appreciate everything. You appreciate running water, not just your car and your house and your kids. You're grateful water came out of your faucet. When you, go, when you remind yourself and you see those things and you think you know, and we do know, but you know at another level when right. you, you go put your life in the middle of that. And the second is, is that I'm gonna every, every month hopefully every month, share my faith off the stage. It's great. One-on-one. -on -one. I am going to put myself in a position to be around someone who's far from God and lead them to Christ. And honestly, one of the greatest challenges that I can give our pastors and our leaders that are listening to me right now is set yourself a goal that I am going to share my faith. And better yet, I am going to lead someone to the Lord at least once a month Otherwise, I'll get locked into this, to the corporate side of our calling, and then our motivation seems to wane from that. And you even encourage us, hey, if you, if you want everyone in the church to be inviting people to church, you have to invite people to church. You need to know what it feels like when your friend's on the front row. I don't think we can build great churches unless all of us are doing that, because we'll, we, we get locked into these environments. And so one of the things that I challenge all of our staff to do is share your faith, invite a friend, because I think when your lost friend is sitting with you in church, you're looking at things you didn't look at when they weren't there. The music matters more differently. The message matters differently. You'll probably even notice things that need to be fixed or improved in the buildings or in the hallway or in how some, some greeter responded because your friend was there. You're noticing things differently. And, and, and the point of all of this is once we're self-aware, once we self-regulate, and once we keep our motivation pure, we're on this road now to having an emotional intelligence and a, a way to relate to people emotionally that, that raises that EQ, which again, Daniel Goldman says is way better uh, and more important than our IQ. Let's get to the fourth one because we're running out of time today because they get better. So there's self-awareness, self-regulation, a pure motivation that goes beyond uh, money or status, and the fourth one is empathy. Now, let me mention to you in his book, he says that the first three components are self-management skills, but the last two now are people management skills. And he would, he would say, and I, I have to agree, Matt, that one of the greatest things that we can possess in our emotional intelligence is empathy. And he defines it this way. It's the ability to understand the emotional makeup of other people. That's right. how he would say it. And the way I would say it is, it's understanding somebody's story. You don't even have to agree with it. And you certainly don't have to approve it to give them the feeling of acceptance. Jesus had this ability to make people feel accepted right. who were so far from what he wanted for their lives. I mean, prostitutes, tax collectors, these people felt comfortable or accepted in his presence while he accepted them and also challenged them to truth. And, and, and it's really important. And Daniel would maintain it begins with wondering 
what is their story that got them there? So let me tell you how I play this one out. Because okay. one of the places where I really get frustrated, and I'm, uh, this is embarrassing to admit, but it really is true. And it happens almost. <laughs> it happens almost every day. Okay, so I wasn't going to tell you how often, but this, this is a good confession. <laughs> uh, good for the soul, bad for the reputation. Here we go. Okay. But it happens to me when I drive. It seems like I, I, am, I am notorious for getting to, into some kind of altercation <laughs> in a car. Somebody will cut me off or I accidentally cut them off and somebody's mad at me. Like, I don't know why this happens so often to me, but it seems to happen. But I've had people do things driving that frustrate me. And, and, I, and, and, and I can go, I can think in my mind, well, you, you know, <laughs> God, can't believe you did that. <laughs> And my little discipline is, I wonder what was going on in their life today that Great. made them that way. So in other words, if they cut me off, could it be because they just got news that one of their children got in a terrible accident and they're rushing home? If we knew that, if that was the case, and it probably isn't, by the way, <laughs> they probably just were a bad driver. But, but if we think that, we, we respond to them completely differently. I'll never forget this one story, Matt, that happened when I was a youth pastor in Colorado Springs. I had this, this, this kid who started visiting our youth group, and we had a very large youth group, and uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of teenagers, and I was preaching, and our kids were really into church and our services. And this, this kid came in dressed in kind of more that gothic black you know, yeah. type of dress, whatever you call that, and, and I remember him disrupting our service, and they did it every week. And I was, I was kept saying, "Hey, brother, come on now, let's 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 calm down back there on the back row." And he, and and he, and he kept on disrupting, kept on disrupting, and I was getting very frustrated with it. And on this one Wednesday night, I told one of our leaders after the service, I said, "I'm done. This is his last service here. I, go get that kid, get him in my office. We're having a come to Jesus today." And when I walked in, the youth leader and this student was in my office and he had his arm folded and looking all frustrated and, and I was so mad at this kid. And, and I walked in and opened the door and just said, hey bro, what's your deal, man? And Matt, he turned around, pulled up his shirt, showed me his back and it was scarred from where his dad was beating him. And he said, this is my deal, man. And I went from mad to wanting to help this guy so much, that's empathy. And by the way, we did help this, this kid. We, we called social services, we got people involved and he got healed from the abuse that he was under. But isn't it amazing that once I understood his story, how everything about how I felt about that person changed. Now I think this is huge. If we're gonna be people with emotional intelligence, we manage ourselves by being aware by being regulated and by being motivated. That's the first three. But this fourth one, having empathy, having the ability to see potential in people before they actually display it. We call it, of course, around here, seeing people through the eyes of faith, not seeing them as they are, but as they could become. And not only seeing it, but saying it. I think it also comes from the ability to appreciate someone who's very different from you and appreciating the differences. My wife is 100% polar opposite of me in every area, uh, in every area. And, and, if you, and if you see that as a bad thing, it'll frustrate the fire out of you. If you'll see it as a compliment to everything that I'm not, well now she's the perfect companion and she is. And I just think that's important for us to understand when we're trying to show empathy. We, we talk about it a lot when we teach pastoral care to dream teamers, you know, which is what we call our volunteers here at Highlands, uh, that you know, there's always more to the story. So if there's more to the story, let's be great journalists and terrible judges. That's so good. Let's just be journalists and find out what's going on in the story, but not judge for what's going on in the situation. So we have self-awareness, self-regulation, a pure motivation. Now we've moved into these people skills of empathy. And here's the last one that Daniel Goleman, he called it social skill. And it's basically, it's, it's, it's the ability to get people to move in the direction you desire, but also the one they, they desire. You're not moving them to your, your outcomes. You're move, moving them toward the outcomes that God wants for their life and the ones that are good for them. He defines it as proficiency in managing relationships 
and motivating people. He redefines it in another way in one place in the book as friendliness with a purpose. Wow. And I like that. I think that's just a cool phrase. And he says in the book that it's the culmination, this quality is the culmination of the other four, that when we get the first four right, then we, all we have to do now is just is have social skill or literally building people in the direction that God desires for their life. And you do that first by just building rapport. In other words, we're, we're not just always in organizational mode. We're also in friend and family right. mode and high five and mode. And so we're socializing. We're fun to be around. And honestly, Matt, you know, one of the reasons why I even chose you to help me with this podcast is you're so much fun. You do what I call owning the room. You, you take responsibility for the environment. And I don't know that I have any leader on my team who does it any better than you in this area. You're kind. I think the motivation for that is wanting, I, I literally walk into spaces and want people to feel special. Like this moment was special. If it's one person in the lobby, I think, you know, one of the pastors we've had on our staff years ago, Pastor Keith Lindsay, who's Pastor Blake's dad, had this unique ability. He talked to me one time, and I remember it was a 30-second conversation, and I felt like he had nowhere else to be. He was present in the moment, and I thought, man, I want to be like Pastor Keith one day. And I think that we walk into every situation wanting to just, man, make it fun, have a great time, make people feel special. It, it changes everything. Now, are you naturally good at that, or is that a decision you're making every day or both? I mean, I got in trouble for everything that I'm doing now when I was in school. <laughs> so uh, I was always the class clown and, okay. and loved that part of it. And so I think some of it is natural, but the older I get, I will say I have to think about it more. I uh, can find myself in task mode a lot more, and some of that comes with responsibility and everything else. But um, so there is some natural ability, but it still has to be worked on every single day. I want to close with a thought, and that's, that is so cool, but I want to close with a thought as an encouragement, and I actually want to do something I don't normally do on the podcast, and that is I want to pray for our listeners, right. because the Bible talks a lot about submitting our emotions and our, our, our impulses and our moods to the Lord. That's what Galatians 5 and the whole fruit of the Spirit and the, and the works of the flesh are all about, that if we can, we can actually come to God and we can say, here's my rage, here's my anger, here's my impatience, here's my lust, here's my temptations, and God, would you replace it with your nature on the inside of me? And I believe this is not only a skill that can be worked on, but I think the beautiful thing about the Bible is it gives us hope that God literally transforms us. And I don't think I'm the person that, that was going to be the person I was going to be That's without great. Jesus. I think I was going to be a lot testier, meaner, um, I think I was going to look a completely different way had I not allowed the Lord to work in my life. And I still have a long way to go, but I'm not anywhere near where right. I was. And I want to leave with that kind of hope to every person who's listening. And if you're driving a car, don't close your eyes, but wherever you are, can I pray for you right now and just ask God, God, help us. Help us with the ability to be more aware of who we are, who we're not. Help us to regulate our moods and impulses before we just let them out, be, be more reflective, slow down a little bit, and don't let just it just blurt out everywhere. Uh, we, need, we need to have these different you know, skills of empathy and, and, and just motivation so that we can lead people that God's called us to lead. And so, Father, I, I thank you for the, 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 the listeners that are on our podcast today and for every leader, every pastor. Every, every person who works on a team at a church, whoever they are, God, the business people that are listening, the moms, the dads, and God, we submit our emotions to you. And Lord, we are not going to stay with you know, who we were before Christ, God, but we are going to allow the work of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us to take every bit of the work of the flesh out of us and put inside of us love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Work inside of us, God, your nature. And especially during this holiday season, let us, let us, as we gather with family and around more people than normal times of the year, let us be even more aware of these beautiful truths so that we can ultimately do what you called us to do, and that is lead people to your desire for their life. And for that, God, we will give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. PC, thanks so much. This has been absolutely incredible. So usable and helpful for all the leaders that are watching today. Excited about this next season we're walking into. Hey, enjoy Christmas, everybody. And excited about the book that's coming out in January. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and we'll see you next time on the Grow Leader Podcast. <laughs>